Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia. And uh, in this session, we will be talking about ETF, liquidity, and market making. So uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in early today. So how are you doing? If you are ready for this session, maybe you can type ready uh, in the chat box and let us know. If you are ready for a session, maybe you can type ready okay, in the chat box and let us know. Uh, hi, yes. Thank you so much for all the response. Huh? So we are used to doing webinar at 8.30, but today we started a bit early, 8 o'clock. And all, many of you here have tuned in early, so we promise you that we'll uh, do whatever within our power to make it well worth your time. So if you're looking for, uh, you're looking for a low-cost way, to do indirect investing through fund through funds, right? Now, ETF is an option that you can consider. Now, of course, when it comes to ETF, right, we know that it is diversified. It gives you a diversified exposure instantly. And But to many retail investors, right, their primary concern is that, you know, ETF got liquidity. You know, do we have liquidity, sufficient liquidity in the market? And today we have got, we have got, uh, you know, one of the market makers, uh, renowned market makers to come to this segment and talk about ETF liquidity. So don't worry, today our speaker will debunk this myth with you, all right? So uh, today this segment is a bit special because we have invited two special guests, okay? Uh, one of whom is from a very famous uh, fund house, which is Value Partners. Okay, I'm very excited for, for this speaker, all right? So, and then the second segment will be conducted by a renowned market maker, okay? So this session will be split to two segments, okay? Where first segment will talk about ETF in general, and then the second segment will talk about liquidity and market making, all right? So we are very honored to have partnered with, you know, value partners in this Bursa webinar. So as usual, disclaimer, so whatever we present in this Bursa webinar is only for educational purpose. So in no way that we give any recommendation to buy or sell any stocks or any funds that we mentioned in these uh, presentations. So in the event that you decide to make any investment, uh, so you do it uh, at your own risk, okay? You're 100% responsible for all your investment decision. So part one, so we are now moving into part one where it's going to be uh, presented by Mr. Kamal uh, Mustaza. So uh, here are the learning outcomes. So in this first part, right, you are going to gain a basic understanding about exchange traded funds, okay? In short, ETFs. You're going to understand the importance of ETF in portfolio allocation. Uh, you will also gain an understanding of the importance of an ETF's liquidity in the secondary market. Uh, learn about market makers' role in providing liquidity. And lastly, you will gain practical trading insights for the retail investor. So these are the learning outcomes for the first part, which will probably take around 14 minutes. So uh, it gave me great honor to introduce our speaker for this first part. Uh, he is none other than Mr. Kamal Mustaza. Okay. Uh, Kamal joined Value Partners Asset Management Malaysia in April 2019 as a fund manager based in Kuala Lumpur and is responsible for research and portfolio management. So he has over nine years of experience in the financial industry, specializing in equity portfolio management. So he was formerly an investment manager at Perkeso, leading the foreign equity team. He was also with Great Eastern Life Assurance Malaysia and prior to that was a fund manager at PMB with a diverse exposure in fund management with domestic and regional geographic focus. He graduated with a bachelor degree in commerce from University of Melbourne and completed the Chartered Islamic Finance Professional Program from International Center for Education in Islamic Finance in Kuala Lumpur. He is a charter holder for the Chartered Financial Analyst, CFA, and Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst, Financial Risk Manager, and Chartered Professional in Islamic Finance. He is also a capital market services representative license holder. So he has a lot of, a lot of uh, credibility and uh, up his sleeve. Okay, so today we are going to hear from Mr. Kamal about ETF. So Kamal, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very much. All so. right. So we have a professional qualified fund manager who joined us in this segment. So I hand over the session to you, Kamal. All right. 
share my screen, yeah? Yes, okay, perfect. The... All right, okay, so awesome. All right, so first of all, I think thank you, uh, Shane, for the kind introduction. So I'll try to live up to the expectation. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so before I proceed with my presentation, uh, allow me to just uh, briefly uh, give some brief uh, overview of the contents of uh, what the presentation is going to be like. Uh, so first of all, I'll be talking a bit about the ETF overview, uh, talking about what is ETF, the types of different ETF and the benefits of ETF. Uh, and and then I'll move to talk about the, a bit about the ETF ecosystem, uh, talking about the market participants, liquidity, as well as the accessing the ETF. Uh, and then uh, I will move on to the ETF landscape, uh, where we will take a brief look on the global ETF landscape as well as the major ETF landscape. Uh, and then we will proceed to the popular construction, uh, one by uh, one uh, by the individual investors and the other by the institutional investors on how ETF can be a powerful investment tool for both of type of these investors. And I think last but not least, uh, we will do uh, a case study uh, based on our recently launched ETF, DPDJ Sharia China e shares hundred to talk more about the the, the 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 liquidity as well as the differences between the price to NAV as well as the what does it mean. Uh, of an ETF tracking a benchmark. Um, so without uh, further ado, so let's just uh, go straight to what is actually an ETF. Uh, so there is, uh, there are various ways to, to define what actually is an ETF. So for simplification purpose, we use uh, the basket of securities wrapped as a single financial product that can be bought and sold on the exchange, on the stock exchange as the definition for, for ETF. Uh, and then from this definition itself, we can already see that it is already implied that ETF is a hybrid between a unit trust fund as well as individual stocks. So similar to unit trust fund, ETF consists of multiple securities as, as its underlying. And similar to individual stocks, ETF can be traded on the stock exchange during the market hours. So what are the differences between ETF, uh, unit trust funds, uh, as well as the individual stocks? So in the case of uh, investors buying directly individual stocks, uh, there is definitely no management fee as you will be the one managing your own portfolio. Uh, at the same time, it gives you the flexibility as well as the discretion to choose what stocks to buy or sell, when to actually buy and sell, and how much do you how much to buy and sell. Uh, but on the downside, in order for for an uh, individual investor to achieve a meaningful diversification benefit. Uh, it requires a high capital. So if you want to have a portfolio of about 20 to 30 stocks, uh, taking into account the trading costs and other expenses, you will need a large capital to invest on your own. Uh, and not to mention, uh, managing your own portfolio requires considerable time as well as uh, the right knowledge, which may not really uh, suit and fit everyone. Uh, on the other hand, if you choose the uh, unit trust fund uh, route, you know that the fund will be actively managed by investment professionals. And this comes at a cost of higher fund expenses coming from uh, both the higher management fee as well as the trading cost due to the higher portfolio turnover. Uh, of course, the unit trust fund will strive to outperform the benchmark. So let's say uh, the benchmark that they are using is FBM KLCI and it generates an annual return of 5%. So the fund will aim to deliver more than 5%. But as we are all human, there is a risk that the, U, the, the UD, UTF might not be able to deliver the outperformance, uh, but instead uh, generate a return much lower than the benchmark, or in some cases generate a negative return for that particular year. So this is a risk that investors should really understand and watch. Uh, then you have ETF somewhere in between stocks and the UTF. So generally, ETF is a passively uh, managed uh, investment vehicle, meaning it will closely track the benchmark. Hence, the return of an ETF will somewhat be, be very similar to the benchmark itself. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about the risk of significant underperformance, which may exist in the UTF space. Uh, at the same time, it is also transparent uh, and you get portfolio diversification through the market exposure. And not to mention, because it is a passively managed, it has lower turnover, hence resulted in lower fund expense compared to the actively managed uh, UTF. So how does uh, an ETF actually work? So let's say earlier this year, you decided that you just want to imitate the performance of S&P 500 by buying into S&P 500 ETF. Uh, the ETF will then replicate the index composition by buying into the underlying shares in the same manner of the index. So if we look at the S&P 500, um, 
the the the, the largest constituent is basically Apple at about 6.1 uh, percent weight, uh, followed by Microsoft at 5.8 uh, percent. So what does this mean? Is that uh, if you have hundred thousand uh, US dollars to 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 invest in the S and P 500 ETF, then the ETF will allocate about uh, 6.1 k on Apple shares, uh, 5.8 k on the Microsoft shares, and so on. So and if you buy and hold the ETF up until September this year, and then hypothetically your ETF portfolio would already generate 15.8% return year to date, which is very close to the S&P 500 return performance of 15.9% year to date. And just to add, when you buy an ETF, you are essentially buying into the ownership of all the companies in the S&P 500 index. So this clearly demonstrates that ETF is not just some fancy financial engineered uh, investment product, but it is a real and quite straightforward product that is backed by real underlying shares, uh, thus bringing the best of both world of stocks as well as index funds. So let me just talk a bit about some of the key advantages of uh, ETF. It is first and foremost uh, transparent. Uh, basically, what you see is what you get. Uh, compared to unit trust funds, investors are able to get full transparency on the ETF constituent, the performance versus benchmark, and cost on a daily basis. Uh, at the same time, ETF offers ample source of liquidity uh, coming not just from the secondary market trading volume, uh, but also the off-market transactions and underlying liquidity from the primary market. Uh, the third one is basically diversification. As I said earlier, uh, ETF consists of a basket of securities, meaning with one single ETF trade, you will get an immediate exposure to uh, multiple securities, thus gaining you the diversification benefit with just one single trade. And like, um, uh, and like I said earlier as well, uh, it is also cost effective as passively managed ETF has lower management fee versus uh, the actively managed uh, UTF. Uh, and last but not least, ETF also offers uh, flexibility and accessibility as it can be traded throughout the day during the market hours. And just to expand a bit more on the diversification part, there's a number of um, academic literature that actually conclude that around 90 to 95% of the variation of return uh, in a portfolio is driven by asset allocation and only between 5 to 10% are coming from both individual stock selection and market timing. So what does this mean is that uh, the asset allocation uh, or an exposure to a particular market uh, will drive a big chunk of the performance of the portfolio. And this is where ETF fits the bill as it offers investors an immediate exposure to the market. Uh, at the same time, as ETF comprises of a basket of securities, uh, the idiosyncratic or the non-systematic risks um, are virtually eliminated from the investor's portfolio, thus enable the investors to achieve diversification benefit with just one single product. And I think lastly, uh, ETF also provide ease of access to foreign investment. As you will see later in the presentation, there are a number of ETF uh, listed in Malaysia uh, with ringgit trading currency that offers foreign underlying asset. So this type of ETF allows immediate and hassle-free process for investors to get foreign market exposure, uh, meaning you don't really have to open up a foreign trading account or foreign currency account. Uh, but instead, you can use your local brokerage account to get this uh, foreign market exposure. So ETF uh, also comes in many shapes and forms, ranging from uh, different assets and sub-asset classes for investors to choose from. So even if there are multiple ETF taking the same, the same market, they are, there will be some differentiating factors due to the different features uh, or overlay imposed on each ETF. So while there may be a number of ETF that is taking the S&P 500, for example, so one, one of the ETF may be passively managed uh, and the other may be semi-actively managed. Uh, and at the same time, in terms of weighting, some may use the market cap uh, weighting and the other might use the equal weighting methodology. Therefore, not all ETF is created the same. And the different features and overlay will uh, result in different portfolio composition, uh, performance, as well as cost. Uh, so now moving on to the ETF ecosystem part. Uh, so while ETF may look quite simple and quite straightforward, there's a lot going on behind the scene. So here we can see that the ETF, uh, we can see the ETF ecosystem, which comprise of key parties that are crucial to the smooth operation of an ETF. I think for the webinar this evening, we have representative from the fund sponsors, uh, which is the ETF managers, which is uh, myself, and also Kenneth on behalf of the liquidity providers. Uh, then you also have the exchange where the ETF is listed and traded, which is in our case is the Bursa Malaysia. And not to forget the ETF service providers that supports the operation and distribution of ETF along with the index data providers 
uh, they provide us the ETF asset managers with the index information, which is crucial for tracking the benchmark. Uh, due to the unique open-ended uh, structure of an ETF, it has a dual existence in the marketplace. Uh, ETF exists in both what is known as the prim primary market that is normally driven by primary ETF creation and redemption by large investors, uh, predominantly the institutional investors, uh, as well as the secondary market where all type of investors, uh, most commonly individual investors, buy and sell them. Uh, so before ETF can be traded on the stock exchange, ETF are created through the interaction of participants in the primary market, namely the participating dealer and ETF issuer. So uh, usually in Malaysia, uh, the participating dealer can also be the market maker. Uh, so the market maker, uh, the primary market is also the one that will drive the size of an ETF as ETF can be continuously created and redeemed based on investors' demand. Uh, so once the ETF is created on the primary market, the ETF can then be bought and sold on the secondary market, which is the stock exchange at the prevailing market price. So basically, uh, just to, 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 to uh, make you understand that for ETF, there is the primary market and the, the secondary market. And I think for most of you, you are more familiar with the secondary market, uh, which is uh, where you actually buy and sell all the shares. Lah. So access to information uh, regarding ETFs are available on aggregate level on the Bursa marketplace. Uh, alternatively, investors can also go to each individual ETF issuer website to get more detailed information regarding any particular ETF by, by that particular issuer. Uh, in regards to the trading platforms, investors can opt for direct direct approach where you can instruct uh, your own broker or execute trades via online trading platforms. Or you can also invest uh, in the ETF via robo-advisory platforms, which allocates your capital to different types of ETF based on your investment preference and risk profile. And then now let's touch a bit on ETF liquidity. There is a common uh, misconception that ETF is not liquid based on the trading volume that is seen on screen. Uh, this is quite misleading as the on-screen volume does not really equate to the overall liquidity of an ETF as there is often significantly deeper markets than what is shown on the screen. Uh, it is important to note that there are three key markets that drive ETF liquidity, uh, namely underlying liquidity and hidden liquidity, with on-screen liquidity is just a small fraction of the true picture on ETF liquidity. Uh, we will revisit this in the case study later uh, to get a better understanding of the ETF liquidity. Uh, and let's say if you uh, still uh, don't really understand what's going on with the ETF liquidity, you can uh, ask Kenneth, who's our market maker, uh, on, on this question a bit later. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about the ETF landscape. Uh, so compared to the overall history of markets, uh, ETF is still relatively new, uh, with the first ETF listed was the SPDR S&P 500 Trust ETF uh, launched in 1993, uh, which seeks to replicate the performance of S&P 500. Uh, it actually took a while for, for ETF to find its footing and gain traction among investors before more products are launched. And by early 2000, we saw ETF actually expand beyond the traditional equity asset class with the launch of the first bond ETF in 2002, uh, followed by other types of ETF, namely the ESG ETF, Smart Beta ETF, and the Commodity ETFs. Uh, leading up to the global financial crisis in 2008, we saw more exotic or alternative uh, exchange-traded products being launched like the exchange-traded notes as well as the leverage and inverse ETF in 2006 and followed by the Sharia Active and Volatility ETF. Even now, we continue to see innovation in the ETF space uh, with the first crypto ETF uh, was launched in Canada early this year. Uh, right now, the AUM for uh, global ETF stood at about $9.5 trillion and counting and this amount is almost double the size of ETF market in 2018. Uh, and this is driven by the new issuance and continuous innovative products. Uh, bulk of the ETF assets are largely dominated still by the US, where the asset size is about $6.6 .6 trillion, or almost 70% of the global ETF asset size. Uh, despite having hundreds of ETF issuers in that market, the top three issuers, uh, namely BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, collectively dominate almost 80% of the total asset for US-based US ETF. And their significant influences are actually reflected in the shareholdings of the S&P 500 components. So if we look at the uh, top five company under the S&P 500, if you can see at the bottom uh, table there, bottom left table there, the top three issuers are in the 
top three largest shareholders of this company. So for Apple, you can see that Vanguard and and I mean Vanguard, BlackRock and State Street are the top three largest shareholders with Vanguard holding about 11%, uh, BlackRock 7.4% and State, State Street about 3.9%. So over to this part of the world, uh, we can see that ETF is still finding its footing, especially in markets like uh, Malaysia with 19 ETF listed uh, with a combined AUM of $0.5 billion. Uh, versus our neighbor Singapore, uh, which uh, have about 31 ETF and uh, combined AUM of about $7.4 billion. Uh, and out of the 19 ETF listed uh, on Bursa Malaysia, 80% of the asset is driven by the ABF Malaysia Bond Index alone, and six out of the 19 ETF are Sharia compliant. Uh, despite that, we believe that. Uh, I mean, Malaysia ETF scene is still is in a, a, a nascent stage that, and we still see opportunities uh, and room for growth in uh, going forward, especially in the sharing R space. So now let's talk about how investors can actually deploy uh, ETF efficiently as uh, portfolio construction tools. There is various approach to add ETF to your portfolio as an individual investors. And the first one is uh, diversification through a single ETF. Um, again, to reiterate my earlier points, ETF consists of a basket of securities. So when you are buying an ETF, you basically get the market exposure, hence achieve the diversification benefits through a single ETF. Uh, so take an uh, for example here in the slide, the VPDJ Sharia China Asia 100 ETF, where the ETF consists of 100 uh, constituents with diverse sector exposure that skewed towards uh, China new economic sector with high allocation in sector like healthcare, IT and consumer. So investing in such ETF will provide investor with uh, direct and immediate market exposure to the underlying index. Uh, at the same time, investors can also combine ETF with uh, your probably your, your, your current domestic single stocks portfolio. So by incorporating the ETF, investors will be able to diversify away from the single country exposure and home market risk due to the operational ease from ringgit denominated foreign underlying asset offered by this kind of ETF that are listed in Malaysia. Uh, and But if you want to be a bit more creative, you can also create a global ETF portfolios by combining the different ETF with uh, foreign underlying assets that are available on Bursa. Uh, at the same time, you can also incorporate your own view of the market by making some tactical adjustment on the asset allocation. So let's say, for example, if you think the US market has peaked given the, the outperformance so far this year, you may want to reduce your allocation to US and increase allocation to other markets like Malaysia or China. ETF can be a powerful tool, not just for individual investors, but also institutional investors. Uh, we continue to see institutions and asset managers globally embracing ETF as part of their investment portfolio, which explain why ETF market has almost doubled in size from 2018 to reach about uh, $9.5 trillion so far this year. Uh, and the portfolio application for ETF for institutional investors are also quite diverse, ranging from uh, being used as a transition tool, uh, liquidity sleeve, portfolio completion, strategic asset allocation, as well as active allocation. Uh, so now let's proceed to the ETF case study uh, using Value Partners VPDJ Sharia China Asia 100 uh, ETF as an example. So the first of its kind, it was launched on the 12th of July 2021 and subsequently listed on the main market of Bursa Malaysia on the 28th of July 2021 under the Bursa stock code 0838EA and Bloomberg ticker CH100RMMK equity. It is benchmarked against the Dow Jones Islamic Market China Asia 100 Index as a passively managed ETF based on full replication uh, methodology. <clears throat> so as our ETF is a passively managed ETF, we consistently try to replicate uh, the benchmark index the best way we could. Uh, but uh, there are some factors that, uh, that, that will and can hinder an ETF from being able to fully replicate the benchmark. Uh, like the size of an ETF, the underlying market dynamics, uh, cash drag, fund expenses uh, that are not reflected uh, in the benchmark. Uh, in the top 10 holdings, you can see that there is some differences uh, in the weight of each constituent between the fund and the index. So let's say, for example, if you look at the contemporary, uh, I mean, the, the largest uh, constituent in, in our portfolio, which is the contemporary Amprex technology, um, which is the basic, uh, which, which is uh, the largest uh, EV battery makers in the world, uh, while our while the index weight is about 8%, uh, our ETF fund weight is about 
Um, so definitely, like I said earlier, I mean, there, there are some factors that, that will and can hinder the NETF from being able to fully replicate the, the, the benchmark. Um, like, I mean, just to reiterate that the size of ETF do play a part, the, the underlying market dynamics, the cash drag, and also the fund expenses. Uh, at the same time, uh, in terms of the asset allocation, ETF will try to minimize the cash portion in order to minimize the tracking error. So if we look at the tracking error of our ETF for the one month, and the tracking error is about 0.8%, uh, which is well below 1%. I think it, that's quite good already. Lah. Um, Yep. Okay. Next, uh, let's take a look at the activities in the primary and secondary market. Uh, we can see that since the launch of the ETF on the 12th of July, there is an NAV movement on a daily basis, even prior to its listing. And this shows that the NAV movement is uh, somewhat di dictated by the performance of the underlying index of Dow Jones uh, Islamic Market China 800, as we can see from the previous slide. Uh, on the secondary market, uh, we can see that the price movement of the ETF starting on the first day of listing. Uh, with market makers like Kenanga help to facilitate the, the demand and supply from investors. Uh, from here, we can actually see that the price of the ETF does, doesn't really correspond to the NAV uh, movement of the ETF. <clears throat> so when it comes to an ETF, there is two types of pricing that investors should be aware of. Uh, so the first one is the market price of an ETF, which is the price at which the shares of an ETF uh, can be bought and sold on the exchange. And this is determined by the demand and supply in the secondary market. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the other is the NAV or the net asset value of an ETF, which represents the total value of each shares portion of the fund underlying asset, plus the cash component minus the fund expenses and liabilities. So the price of an ETF on the secondary market may be more or less than the net asset value of the underlying securities. Uh, so several factors actually influence the, the ETF price in the secondary market, including the share price movement of the underlying securities, the, the, the currency exchange rate movement, uh, as well as investors' uh, demand for that particular ETF. Uh, while price may not be, uh, I mean, may not equal to the NAV, investors should actually factor in the prevailing NAV when, when deciding whether or not to invest in the ETF via the exchange. So using NAV as the yardstick or, yardstick or guidance for you to decide whether or not it is the right entry price uh, for, the, for the ETF. Lah. And here is the last part, uh, is basically the actual example of the different layers of ETF liquidity that we talked earlier, uh, that we saw since the listing of our ETF. And you can clearly see that there is an ample source of liquidity to cater for different investors' demand. I mean, so, this is just to reiterate the on screen liquidity is just a fraction of the total liquidity provided uh, by the ETF. Uh, there's also the hidden liquidity, which is basically the inventory by the market makers, as well as the primary liquidity where we do the, the underlying primary creation and redemption. Uh, so that's all from me. So I'll pass it over to Shane. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Kamal, for this wonderful presentation on the ETF and also liquidity. So let me go to the part two, where we'll invite our next speaker. Okay. All right. So allow me to briefly introduce our next speaker. Uh, he is Kenneth Teo. So Kenneth graduated from the University of Technology, Sydney in Australia with a business degree majoring in accounting and finance. As a capital market services professional with 14 years of experience, he has vast experience in various roles within the financial services industry. Kenneth's experience ranges in areas across the front office functions in the investment banking space, such as retail and institutional dealing, proprietary trading, and equity derivatives. His area of expertise is mainly in the equity derivative space, having helped build and lead the ED trading desk at two investment banks in the past 10 years, culminating in the first award given by Bursa Malaysia to a local issuer as the best issuer of structural warrants in 2020. Currently, as head of trading in Kananga IB's equity derivatives department, he oversees the entire trading desk operations, trading in multiple instruments ranging from structural warrants, ETFs, and other OTC derivatives, and across multiple markets. So this is the background of Kenneth. All right, Kenneth, are you ready? Yeah, thank you. Yes. 
So today we are very honored to have Kenneth in the house to share with us. So this, he's one of the renowned uh, market issuer, uh, market maker for uh, ETF. All right. So uh, over to you, Kenneth. Okay. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, allow me to share my screen. Okay, um, can you guys see my screen? Please give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yes, perfect, can see your perfect. screen. Okay, yep, okay. But you have to go on full screen, yeah? Yep, one second. Yeah, I see a lot of thumbs up. Okay. Full screen, you see it? Yes, perfect. Great. Okay, let's start. Uh, okay. Okay, I think I've gone way beyond to come out so far. Let me just forward again. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shane, for the kind introduction. Um, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking your time today to join us in this very uh, hopefully fruitful session about ETFs. Um, I think Kamal has really already stole the show, introducing ETF and covering a very, very um, substantive knowledge about ETF. So <clears throat> I won't go too much into ETF, but um, really just want to start with saying that uh, what a fantastic product an ETF is uh, to think about it. What some of the benefits that Kamal spoke about, diversification, right? Low fees, um, participation in foreign markets. I mean, how else would you participate in the S&P 500? Think about it, right? Uh, 500 stocks, the best, biggest, largest stock in the US for a fraction of the price, right? All these, guess what's the um, fee for the SPY, which is the world largest ETF? A mere 0.095%. And then looking at last year's um, record, I think um, for those of you who have been following the US market, it's just been phenomenal. Um, some quantitative easing plays a role, all this money, helicopter money, whatever they call it, but S&P uh, 500 or SPY, the ETF specifically, right? Year to date has um, uh, made 23%. I mean, 23% for um, a year's return is pretty good, right? I mean, you you... If you have invested long enough, you realize that 23% is quite good. And all this for less than 0.1%. So, I mean, ETF is really a fantastic product, but the question here is, um, what makes all of this possible? Uh, what makes uh, such, uh, what gives you access to so much, um, uh, access to so much like stocks in just one instrument? Well, the answer here is actually the ecosystem. So I want to take some time today to really talk a, lot, talk a little bit about the functions of um, um, the participating dealer first. I'll start off. Um, then I want to move on to the market making process because it's interrelated, as you will see. And then uh, we'll go on to talk a little bit about the liquidity. Uh, I think Kamal has already covered a little bit. I'll just talk from a perspective of a market maker. All right. So, okay, I'll start first with these um, features of, uh, I want to compare mutual funds, ETF, and single stock. I think here, I just really want to focus on the open-ended nature of uh, ETFs, right? If you see the shares outstanding here can change on a day-to-day -day basis based on creation and redemption. So this is actually a very key feature in ETFs, yeah, as you will see when I demonstrate uh, why. So, this allows us market makers to expand or reduce the size of this ETF based on demand and supply. So this is actually very key in the process of price equilibrium or price discovery. So in other words, right, the role of the PDs, uh, which in short participating dealers and market makers, um, the, it's vital for it to trade close to the NAV, these functions. So just really the pricing, you see this, Firstly, is the ability to uh, do this thing called creation redemption. Secondly, is um, ETF is special because it trades in a, a primary and a secondary market. It helps with uh, price discovery and 
the valuation close to its uh, NAV. And then liquidity is very crucial as well, as we can say, because it, you're not just looking at the liquidity of the ETF, but also for um, uh, you're looking at the liquidity of the underlying market. Okay, so this this is the this is the this is the function of a market maker. So who are market makers and who are PDs, participating dealers? And the question is, why do we need market makers? Well, the simple answer to why do we need market makers is, of course, so that you guys can easily buy and sell, right? <laughs> as as a there's an opposing party whenever you want to buy and sell. So our role here is to be a willing buyer and willing seller to invest at any time. That, that's a, a, our, our role as a market maker. So in other words, it's to satisfy customer demand to buy or sell an ETF, right? But actually the market maker's role is much, much bigger than that. Um, it's compared to like a stock. If you think of a stock, usually uh, when a stock or a company want to go listing, it goes for an IPO. It has this book building and... Um, IPO process where people subscribe to its share before even listing, right? For an ETF, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, what happens prior to a launch of an ETF is usually there is a book building phase and then you, the fund managers and come out, go around and talk to people and gather people to say, you know, this is my product and things like that. Um, then they can go to the PDs or they can wait for the listing. So see, that 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 is um, why the market makers and PDs are essential because um, for a brand new ETF, when there's no holders or there's no AUM, you need market makers because they are the one who's like on the first day with listing, you see the buy and the sell. Those, that's the key role. So without market makers, you cannot launch an ETF. Without the PDs, you cannot launch an ETF. So essentially, uh, market makers are um, counterparties to the buyers and the sellers. Okay, and it's bottom part here. We're just talking a little bit about the issuer, how this, this process works is the ETF issuers will issue ETF shares to the PD. In this case, uh, it's also the same. Usually, it's the same uh, investment bank. In our case, uh, in Kananga, it will be the PD and the market maker. In return, what will we as PD do is we will actually uh, pay cash to the ETF issuer or it can be also an in-kind creation where we give uh, shares to them. And then in, uh, in return, the PD will actually can either pass the units to the market maker or they can actually deal direct with uh, investors. So uh, ETF issuer uh, via trustee issues creation basket uh, at NAV. And then the, others, the other process is actually when you want to redeem, you can also redeem via the PD. Uh, um, so you go to a PD and then you say, okay, I want to give up my ETF units and then they give you NAV and then uh, they give you the, the cash at NAV. So yeah, that's very briefly. So I'll, I'll start off with the PD process first. So this is what happened typically in, a, in, a, in an ETF. You have a market maker, even as market maker, I'm just seg segregating the role here because market makers do go to PD as well, uh, even though they can be within the same organization or an investor. What they do is they push cash or securities if it's an in-kind, and then the PD will uh, engage the fund manager or the sponsor. And then in return, uh, they get the ETF units. This is the, called the creation process. Okay, very crucial. And then the re redemption process is just the opposite where um, investors come to the PD and say like, okay, I want to surrender my uh, ETF units or take profit, if you will, uh, at NAV, the primary market. Then they go there, they, the shares gets passed to the fund manager, it gets cancelled. In return, they get, cash or security, uh, they get the cash or securities back. So the creation and redemption process is a function of the primary market. Now. It's very important. So in ETF, I mentioned earlier in the features that they have two, we have two separate, which is the primary and the secondary market. It fast, it, it, there's many functions. First and foremost, it's, um, it, it helps facilitate the assessing the liquidity of an ETF uh, underlying market. So when you come to me, I'm the PD, I will, or you come to me as a market maker, right? Um, I will go and say, okay, you want this? I will actually go and to a PD and say, I want to buy this X basket. I want to create this basket. And then what happens is typically uh, we'll go and purchase the shares, right? Purchase the shares from the underlying market. That's why we say underlying liquidity of an ETF. Um, then we mentioned about open-ended. The open-ended issuance enables ETFs to grow to accommodate demand. Okay, arbitrage opportunities exist between the primary and secondary market. 
This is the reason why ETF trades very close to its NAV. Okay, um, I'll show you in the next slide how this works. So this is a creation arbitrage, we call it. Uh, so market makers or any investors with uh, sufficient money to create a basket can actually do this. So imagine a share like uh, any share, let's say the, the price uh, of this ETF is the NAV is 202, okay? What, what we market makers would typically do is we, we because this is a premium, as you will see, um, we will sell short the shares in the secondary market. We can, there are a couple of ways we can do it. We can sell it short by uh, borrowing, or we can also uh, have inventory to sell it. Then what happens is we will sell it at a premium, 205, and then we will hedge it. The, 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 the most important key aspect here is we, we need to hedge it because NAV is achieved at the end of the day. So what we will typically do is we will, at the same time, that's why we call it an arbitrage, buy the underlying basket or futures contract because it can be uh, based on futures as well. So what happens is this, we will eliminate the price uh, price movement, right? So because I already sell and then I buy um, whatever up and down, it just tracks. I won't lose anything. So at the end of the day, I will unwind this hedge position by uh, purchasing the stocks or covering my shot in the futures contract, what we call close out this hedge position at the end of the day, and then lock in profits. Because now I will go to the fund manager and say, look, I want to create a basket of shares. Okay, when I create a, the, the, the ETF basket, I will create it at the NAV 202, right? So close out the underlying, thereby recognizing a profit between the 205 and 202. Okay, then what happens is the next day, depending on the ETF, uh, usually T1 or T2, we get the ETF shares at NAV. Okay, then we deliver the shares to, 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 our, to the people that we have sold the ETF shares uh, earlier, right? So settlement on short position, thereby that's it, we recognize the profit. Okay, this, this, this mechanism is super important because what will happen is then um, as more and more market makers or investors come in to do this, this thing called the creation arbitrage, what will happen is this, the, the price in the market and the NAV will narrow. Right? But narrow to a certain extent, it will never like uh, be the same. La. But you, as you will see, some large ETFs like the SPY, uh, it's pretty close. Like there's almost no no difference. There's no premium or discount, or it's in the dec third, third decimal. So this is what we call the creation arbitrage. So for the creation arbitrage to work, there's also got to have be the opposite mechanism, which is what we call the redemption arbitrage. Okay, redemption arbitrage. Is, let's say as a market maker, I, I, I know that the value, the value is currently um, maybe the ETF value is two bucks NAV, right? What I'll do is uh, I'll buy the ETF shares. Um, I think here there's a typo, sorry, it should be uh, buy ETF shares at uh, a lower price, okay? Say 199. And then uh, I will do the opposing opposing hedge, which is the short the futures contract or short the basket of stocks, and then close it out at the end of the day by uh, covering my short, and then uh, create redeem, redeeming the ETF units. So you see, this this both both mechanism helps to actually bring the premium or discount to a closer closer band. So here we can see the whole process. We have the ETF issuer, uh, like value partners. They, 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 the creation redemption ultimately goes to them via a PD, but goes to them uh, through usually a trustee. And then us, um, we will hedge our position through the market right here, Bursa Malaysia. So this gray part here is all actually the primary market. Like you can see the ETF creation redemption flow here. And then the, all these bottom blue parts here, the arrows here is actually the secondary market where um, actual ETF units is transacted. Okay, so investors go to Bursa Malaysia, Kenanga as market maker post bid and offer here and then it gets transacted. Okay, so this is the ecosystem. So this, this, this is the PD process. Okay, now moving on, I want to talk a little bit about market making process. Okay, so the market making process, okay, how what is the market making process? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to start with NAV. What's NAV? Uh, what's high NAV? You know, NAV is the net asset value, as Kamal mentioned, is the value of all the constituent in the basket, right? And then the high NAV is something we used to calculate. Uh, this is called the intraday NAV, if you will. 
it needs to calculate the life or streaming value of the whole basket uh, per, per, per ETF unit, right? So we need to know where, where, what's the value of this basket. Then after that, what will happen is then we market makers would apply a cost, right? Our cost can be many things. We have brokerage costs. Uh, we have creation redemption costs, um, infrastructure costs like systems and stuff like that. Uh, then we also pay the fund management fee. As you know, you know you, you, when you buy an ETF, there's a fund management fee involved really small but still there's some fee there so this is the cost so we will calculate our cost and then we will post bid and us right and all this is on an automated basis you know uh, it moves as the NAV moves so we will get a streaming NAV we post bid we post us uh, then we post whatever margins we need and then we uh, above our cost is actually our profits as you can see this is one of the ETF that we actually market make uh, very, very small. You don't even see a spread here. It's only one cent. So actually the cost is very, very low, right? You don't even see a spread like 185, 187 or something like that. So sometimes typically the cost can be in point, in a fraction, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.5%, right? So INF is a theoretical basket price. Then we calculate the streaming. Then we place bid offer. That's, that. That's the how a market making process works. Okay, this slide, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that, okay, it's important for an ETF, right, to have uh, multiple market makers because uh, it makes it more competitive, okay? Uh, everybody, every market makers uh, will have their own spread or their own cost. So the more you, the market maker is, the more market makers there is in the market, right, you, you actually get a thinner spread. So here, you, what, what we do is I show an INAV and then we have cost one, cost one basically is the first market maker. And then anything above here, it's a profit to the initial market maker, but then another market maker must have a higher cost and then you only profit from here. So as you can see, right, uh, what happens is it actually narrows the spread, the more market makers you have because it, it gets very competitive, right? We, we, we market makers typically make money from, uh, like I mentioned, the, we can do the creation, redemption, arbitrage, right? Then other things is, of course, the normal market making spread, buying low sell high, so it's just the bid offer spread. Then we also can do things like we can borrow, loan out um, ETF units to make, and then we also can make money from the rebates from a stock exchange, right? Uh, as an appointed market makers. So all market makers will have different cost structure and different revenue structure. That's, so that's very important when we have actually more market makers. But having said that, right, um, another point to note is that for every new ETF, like I said earlier, to function, you, you need a market maker. So typically any new ETF, you have one or two market makers, usually uh, quite little, but it's also crucial because they are the guys, they are the guys who actually provide you the bid and offer, right? Okay, so I just want to show you some of these largest ETFs in the market, right? You, if you look at the spread, uh, SPY, it's nothing, right? Between this is the spread between the, the NAV and mm, the market price, averagely. Really, really small. You see all this is the biggest ETF in the US. And then if you look at this uh, Bloomberg screenshot, right? This whole line, white line looks like actually one white line, but it's actually two white lines. So there's a net asset value and there's a last price. It's almost indistinguishable. Therefore, you actually only see one white line. So that's how small the spread is when you grow to a size like an SPY. Right? You see the average fund percent premium here is only 0 0.0092. Right? It's less than 0.01%. Um, yeah, but this is ideal, right? This is what we aspire to, to get to. And yeah. So next one, I just want to cover a little bit on liquidity as market makers. Uh, this is what I call like a pyramid or iceberg. What you see as an investor is only the top green part here, the on-screen liquidity. Okay. Um, what you don't see is the bottom part here, the yellow part and the bottom uh, underlying liquidity in the actual market itself. So when we market make, right, we always uh, quote uh, to you in the screen, but we also assess the underlying market. So as Kamal said, like, you know, when he, when we do market making for something like value partners, this is like a the Sharia compliant of the 100 largest Sharia compliant stocks in China. And you can imagine if you just do a quick Yahoo finance search and then you look at some of these 
Kui Chao Mao Tai or something of the stock, and you look at the liquidity, right? Those actually is potential liquidity for us market makers. So when we when we quote, we can just quote fifty thousand, but we will continuously replenish the size because it depends on how we can hedge our position, right? And and there are various of ways that we can actually hedge our position. So 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 this is actually we can go to uh, other RFQ or market makers itself, or we also can go direct to the market. So that's why we say liquidity in ETF. You don't really want to see the volume or the average daily volume because those is just really a tip of the iceberg, right? Here's another example I just uh, borrowed from our friends at City. Uh, you can see it on screen liquidity. If you have a trade of 1.5 million, everything gets uh, executed because your average daily volume is 3 million. But this whole entire part, right? It's actually your potential liquidity. You have um, hidden liquidity of uh, 20 million and then underlying liquidity of additional 5 billion. And then you see if this part, you get on-screen trade of 15 million trade, some gets executed in the ETF itself. And then after that, the underlying liquidity, you access it via, of course, market makers, right? So just to demonstrate that it's much more than what you see. So you see, if we just pick one of these US listed equity, you see the daily volume is just 5 point, sorry, 5.4 or 5.5 uh, million, but you can see spikes in volume. It goes up to 10.7 million or 20 million. All this is because market makers can, can assess liquidity from a, another market, like the underlying market, right? So yeah, last but not least is uh, for investors, it's very important to know that we are always there and uh, Bursa Malaysia has uh, given us this thing called the CMDF fund. And for us to earn CMDF fund, we also have some sort of obligation. This is to protect the investing public. So we need to be in the market, uh, market making 80% of the time, and the bid-ask spread is only 8 bits, which is quite small because uh, the bid-ask spread is, let's say, if it's half a tick, it's only 4 cents, and then the minimum volume size is 30k. But again, as I said, 30k is not so important because we replenish as long as the underlying basket of securities has volume or the underlying futures has volume, then this, 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 this bid offer volume doesn't really mean anything, right? So, in summary, uh, ETF's very unique structure allows it to trade two distinct markets, which is the primary and secondary market. So, because of this, um, it can grow. It can grow very big because it can grow as big as the, the underlying market. And, and this opportunity for us to arbitrage between the two gives uh, a fair value in terms of the secondary market, right? So this, the PD and MM rule is actually very, very vital in the functioning of an ETF market. So more ETF market makers in ETF will make secondary market more competitive, as mentioned, like the SPY example. And the available liquidity is based around the underlying components of ETF already said many times. And uh, liquidity is multi-layered, iceberg again. And yeah, historical volume is a bad indicator. So just, uh, I think that's all for me. Uh, I pass it over to Shade. Or questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Kenneth, for a very technical session. I think today we have learned a lot about how the back end of the market making works. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's only a very rare occasion that we get to invite uh, one of the market makers to come and join our presentation. And today we know the back end work and how it, it, how it functions uh, for providing liquidity in the secondary market and also the primary market. So thank you so much, uh, Kenneth, for showing us uh, th th this knowledge. So if any questions for both our speakers, uh, fund managers from Value Partners, come out and also uh, market maker from uh, Kenanga Investment Bank, Kenneth, uh, please write in the Q&A box. Uh, so we can easily manage your question. Okay, uh, don't write in the chat box. Uh, chat box, I can't, uh, because with all the overwhelming messages, so I could have overlooked your uh, question. So write in the Q&A box, all right? So yeah, Philip Lowe would like to ask the first question. Uh, ETF in Malaysia has just started recently uh, on a scale of zero to 10, right? Uh, where do you see that we are right now? Uh, Anybody want to take this? <laughs> Kenneth, want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Kamal, you said you're going to take it, right? 
Okay, I, I, I think I can I can take this one. Lah. Um, uh, I think first and foremost, uh, we need to 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 I mean be realistic and understand uh, that even in the US, uh, which is the most developed ETF market, it took them about ten years for ETF to gain uh, traction within the invest uh, within the investment community, lah. Uh, so that's the first thing, and the second thing, I hope I'm not going to get reprimanded lah for for giving the the numbers here. Um, so I think I think uh, personally, I think this is more on, on on a personal level. I think we are somewhere between three to four, um, uh, because yeah, I think ten definitely is the US. Uh, but I think even our 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 neighbor Singapore, I think they are somewhere around six seven, and Hong Kong is about I think seven to eight. Um, yeah, please don't reprimand me from saying this. Uh, but at the same time, I think because we are still at that uh, three to four scale, I think there's a lot of opportunities going forward. Uh, hence why I think we can only get better from now on. Mm. Um, yeah, Kenneth, anything to add? Fill <laughs> uh, the gap. Okay, um, I mean, Bursa Malaysia is here as well, right? So I think they have been very accommodative, but uh, the regulatory structure is actually one of the very key component of ETF. Lah. So um, it's constantly changing from our experiences we learn in Taiwan and US or so I think I think the regul- regulatory uh, structure needs to uh, change yeah. with the times. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in other words, you still have a huge room for growth. Uh, so a fantastic opportunity for upside. Okay. So yeah. I think Busan Malaysia is also uh you know investing a lot of resources to make sure that the public investors know what exactly are ETFs. So that's why we have this session okay to educate the retail investor in the exchange traded funds so that as more people as more people uh, uh believe and uh, know about etf and believe in etf then the aum will grow when aum grow then a lot of things will become more competitive right so uh, as the size grow then uh, the bid spread will be narrow and then the you know the expense will go down as well so you see so that's why uh, you know, if you are looking into a low-cost way to gain and uh, to do indirect investing, uh, ETF is uh, one of the avenues that you can uh, really seriously consider. So uh, Philip would like to ask the next question. What are the two main gaps that we need to fill in Malaysia ETF space uh, for it to be widely accepted here? <laughs> is it lower fees? Um, I, I think mm. I there's already uh, uh, a bit answered that but uh, probably I can add a few things um okay i do agree that uh, that that, that, that uh, like you said i mean the continuous education is needed to increase the awareness uh for it yeah and probably the, the the regulatory part can can i mean there's always room for improvement on the regulatory part um and at the same time i think um uh, I, I mean from i mean from my experience we always hear the the debate of passive versus active where there is a misguided concern that the advent of etf uh, will actually cannibalize the actively managed uh, unit trust fund business, which is not mm-hmm. necessarily the case. Uh, like I presented earlier, even the global institution use ETF as part of their investment tool. Uh, so definitely there is a room for ETF to be used in the active space. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think at the same time, the, the, the gaps is also uh, as a result of the low fee and the no sales charge of the ETF. So there is no really an incentive for the unit trust agent to actually promote uh, and, and distribute ETF to their clients. Lah. And I think that the, the other gap is basically, um, it's like a chicken and egg situation lah, where you actually need to see a demand before ETF issuer can actually commit to create a new ETF product. Uh, mm. But at the same time, uh, you actually need a complete suite of uh, ETF available in the market to actually yep. stimulate the demand by investors. Lah. Mm. So we need more product from you guys, come on. Yeah, but we need to see the, <laughs> but from our point of view, we need to see the demand uh, to have a feasible, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 it's true, it's true. I totally Always agree a with chicken that. and chicken egg, egg issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 wisely yeah. said, okay. Mm. Um, so the next question is directed to Kamal. Huh? Uh, would you mind to explain on the last slide on your ETF uh, slide, huh? M- namely, off-market blocks done by DJ China ETF Fund. All right. Um, okay, I think I'll just uh, share with you this, this, this. I think this is taken from the Busa's website. It's basically the the, uh, the summary of, of, of what's happening in the market. Like, so if you look at the exchange traded part, uh, I mean exchange traded uh, fund part on the top 
there, you can see that there's a market transaction as well as the direct business transaction. So the market transaction is basically the on-screen uh, volume that you see. Uh, whereas for the direct business transaction, uh, it occurs, uh, it, it, it actually occurs uh, macam over the counter lah. I mean, it doesn't actually reflect it on the screen. Yeah. I hope I do answer the, that, that question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the next question is slightly easier. So is there any S&P 500 ETF on Bursa Malaysia market? Yeah, let me answer that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think I think there's there's one ETF that actually uh, with the under with the uh, underlying assets on the uh, US yes. lah. Yeah, mm. Mm. I think uh, I, that is uh, I think Afin Huang Asset Management also have something like that. Mm. Okay. The next question is when ETF is sold in the market, will that affect the underlying share price? Um. Uh, okay, so when when uh, I mean uh, I assume that when the, the ETF sell on the secondary market, right, the exchange. Okay, so um, so when when this happen, it doesn't really affect the ETF itself because there's no like uh, cash flow into or out of the ETF. Uh, that would require it to purchase or sell uh, securities. Uh, so as a result, I think I think there's 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 no. I mean I mean to to, to put it simply, there's no 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 impact. Yeah. Mm, okay. It's back back to the um question on the the liquidity from the underlying market and stuff like that. So I think because of the fact that ETFs are open ended, so the creation. Uh, mechanism allows the, the the ETF to maintain. Whereas if you have a close ended fund. Um, you only have got X number of units, so the purchase of uh, the close end the fund can actually uh, increase the price of it. Mm. Mm. Okay, I see. Thanks for clarification. Um, the next question is by Ken. Now, when underlying stock declared dividends, uh, will the ETF unit holders receive the dividends? I think this depend uh, on 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 uh, individual ETF. Uh, I think for for our case in uh, in in the case of the VPTJ Sharia China Asia hundred ETF, uh, we I mean we don't commit to a dividend distribution, uh, because uh, I think firstly the, the 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 dividend from the the underlying index is also quite uh small, and even the fact that it is skewed towards a new economic China new economic sectors, then then the, the 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 composition of the ETF is skewed towards this growth companies that doesn't really uh, offers. Uh, 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 dividend. So that's why we, I mean, for our case, we don't actually distribute the dividend that we receive from the underlying share. We kind of like reinvest the, 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 the dividend into the, the ETF. Okay, so you reinvest into ETF. Yeah. Lah. But, but for some other ETF, they, 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 they probably do provide the dividend distribution lah, depending on the, the strategy or the, the objective mm. of the ETF. Yeah. So when we buy ETF, we need to know who are the issuers and then so we can check with them like, whether what is the dividend policy, okay? Yes. Mm. Okay. Uh, Wong Sam would like to ask the next question. If ETF is liquid, like what Kamal explained, does that mean that I can always get to sell ETF anytime? I'll take this, Kamal. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank> okay. <laughs> okay. So... Yeah, that is actually the role of a market maker, right, Wong? So as we mentioned, we are always there to provide uh, you the avenue to, where to, to buy or to sell the ETF. So that's the role of the market maker. And we, we mentioned that the liquidity or if you're looking at daily, daily trading, trading volume, that's not very important because what's more important is um, the underlying basket that has liquidity. So that's the convenience of an ETF. You don't have to really worry about that because it's taken care by us, the market makers. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yet, Xiao would like to ask the next question. What is the minimum investment of a Malaysia ETF? So that's the first question. Oh, okay. Uh, I think the minimum investment for Malaysia ETF on the secondary market uh, is the one trading lot, lah, which is basically 100 shares. Mm, yeah, yeah, I think uh, generally the ETF in Malaysia is about la, yeah. 1 over ringgit. La. Our, our unit price now is also about, on average, about 1 ringgit plus. 
So it's one lot lah. Huh? Yeah. So uh, the next question by him is to retail investor, what are the risks in investing in ETF? Um, I think generally when it comes to the investing in ETF, uh, because it is um, a basket of securities, so basically the risk is basically the, the, the market risk. Um, so let's say if, if you are you are you want to buy the, the our BPD China China Asia Sunday ETF, then the, the risk is basically what's happening in the China market will actually affect the, the underlying share price and in, in turn will affect the, the, the ETF performance. I think that that's one of the more I mean most prevalent risks for the ETF. Yeah. I think that then there's other risks, uh, things like the foreign currency, if you are investing in a foreign underlying assets. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you must know what ETF you are buying, okay? Yeah. So you know what are the specific market risks that could affect the ETF performance adversely. So uh, the next question by him is, is leverage available in exchange traded funds? Yes. <laughs> There's uh, what, we, what uh, we call the leverage and inverse ETFs is uh, available. Mm. And so uh, there's actually the KLCI leverage and inverse ETF. So two times leverage inverse is... Uh, just minus one, so you you uh, minus one is like buying, uh, it's like shorting the KLCI, uh, yeah. and two uh, times two is just uh, two times the returns daily returns. Mm, yeah, I think so far Kenanga issued those lah. Huh? Yep. <laughs> All right. So if you are so so far right now in the market, we have the leverage ETF uh, that give you two times exposure. So uh, so if you feel that KLCI will go up. One uh, if you go up, then you can actually gain a leverage exposure by buying le uh, leverage ETF on KLCI. Of course, uh, we have also have an inverse ETF that give you a negative one time exposure. So if you feel that uh, you know if you feel that market will go down, then you can buy like uh, inverse ETF so you can gain the opposite exposure. Okay, if you if you are bearish on the market, then you can buy inverse ETF. So we not only have leverage, we also have inverse ETF in the Bursa Malaysia market. Uh, the next question is like PY. Uh, how do we know what stocks make up the China ETF from value partners? All right. Uh, so this is for me. So I think just um, I, I find it, uh, I, have, I find virtual presentation is always the best uh, kind of presentation. So let me share my screen here. Uh, so if you go to our website, uh, you can actually, uh, actually, can you see what's, what's I'm showing on the screen. Yes, can see. Yeah, okay. Your okay. browser. So, yeah, all right. So basically, you can see that that uh, if you go to our website, you can go to the the composition part. You can actually see the the uh, sector exposure as well as the uh, comp uh the, the constituent uh of the the the, the ETF lah. So given that our ETF invests in the hundred names, so you can see all the hundred names uh in the ETF uh, along with the sectors as well as the weighting. Hmm. Okay. Do you publish the NAV every day? Yes. Mm. Okay. Excellent. So if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to gain exposure into the Chinese market without the hassle of creating, you know, uh, you know, ass assessing, doing direct investing into the China Asia, you know, having access to China Asia is not easy. Okay. Uh, so you can go through uh, the uh, one of the ETF by uh, uh, value partners. Okay, which give you exposure to the Sharia stocks list, uh, listed in the uh, Shanghai market, Shanghai and Shenzhen market, right? So the next question by Maslan Yusuf is, what is the difference between ETF and DLC? I think DLC stands for Daily Leverage Certificate. Gentlemen? Um, okay, I think I can answer this one. Yeah. So I think it's it's um, different. Exchange traded fund is a fund, right? So you have uh, a lot of parts into a fund. You have uh, the trustee, and then you have to actually announce all your things, announce all your holdings, as uh, what Kamal mentioned previously. And daily leverage certificates is just an instrument, right? Listed, I think in Singapore they have it, uh, the uh, certificate that you can leverage up to four times, and it's just like sort of a note that you can just. Uh, buy on a certain share and then get the leverage return. So it's actually similar to a leverage inverse uh, ETF. But uh, I think the leverage inverse ETF will have a bit more transparency uh, because we still tell you that uh, what's the holdings of a, a leverage uh, ETF uh, in the form of futures contracts or everything. Yeah. So the daily leverage notes, your counterparty risk is actually the, the, the person issuing it, which is the bank. 
Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. So far on uh, Bursa Malaysia, uh, we we don't have any uh, DLC yet, uh, daily leverage certificate, but you can find it, uh, you know, in other markets. Uh, huh? uh, essentially, you know, uh, it is a, also a structural product, you know, very sophisticated in nature, but it give higher leverage. Uh, it give higher leverage than the leverage and inverse ETF. So, uh, you know, you really need to know what you are doing, okay, and uh, because you know it can destroy your equity very fast uh, if you if the market go against you, okay. The let me see the next question. Amir Aswar, okay, would like to know. I'm still learning about investment in general. May I know your thoughts about the difference between index fund and ETF? Uh, I think Kamal would want yeah, to take sorry. this. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so um okay basically the similarity between index fund and etf basically they 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 they, uh, they, they give the exposure to the benchmark indexes uh diversification low cost and turnover uh, but i think the difference is that i think largely on the the, the uh, accessibility the flexibility uh that is offered by the etf is not available by the index fund and at the same time it, uh, although it is uh, although index fund is a passively uh, managed uh, kind of like unit trust fund uh but it it, it the, uh, it has a higher uh, management fee compared to generally has a higher management fee compared to uh, just buying an ETF lah. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much the, the, the key difference lah between the index fund and, and as well as the ETF. Lah. Yeah. Mm, okay. So the next question uh, is about uh, how does ETF hedge forex exposure, for example, your China, China ETF from value partners? What is the lifespan of ETF? All right, I think uh, the first part, uh, we don't really hedge the forex exposure. So uh, basically, we take the FX as it is. Um, uh, so yeah, that's another risk for, for investors uh, that, that, that investors need to watch. Uh, and in terms of the lifespan of an ETF, I think it is uh, basically the objective of every ETF issuers to, I mean, for their ETF products to have like a going concern or like uh, to, 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 to live on perpetually lah. Uh, but I think the the but it all depends on the size of the ETF lah because for for every ETF there's uh the, the break even point where it is uh where 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 differentiate between whether it's uh, profitable to operate an ETF as well as uh not profitable to operate an ETF lah. We already know that ETF is a low cost investment, so there's not not much that that ETF issuer can get from 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 ETF itself. So yeah. It all depends on the support and the demand from the investors. Mm, okay, so if the AOM be, uh, become too too low, then it might risk being delisted, lah, huh? Yes. Mm, okay. Other than that, uh, the lifespan should be forever. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Enough. You know, support from investors. <laughs> Kelvin would like to ask any suggestion can uh to to make our ETF more liquid, uh? We hope that we can get out as we will instead of hoping the market liquidate enough to get a good price. Liquid enough to get a good price. Maybe Kenneth would like to take this? Yeah. Um, suggestion on how to make an ETF more liquid. I think first and foremost is uh, the ETF. Again, I'm mean, going to uh, repeat this again. It's the ETF underlying market. So if an ETF is based on like the China 100 uh, Sharia, Sharia China 100, I don't think there's any problem with uh, liquidity. Therefore, uh, you can liquidate it at any time because we're always there to take your, your, your shares back or to, for you to liquidate your shares or to buy more shares. So I think the, to, in a nutshell, it's just basically to see the, um, what's the component of the ETF. Mm, okay. Uh, the next question by Kelvin is how to ensure market makers earn money as well as ETF trader also earn money. Either one party is not making money, then this game will not last. Okay, this is actually a very good question, but it's actually not a I win, you lose kind of situation. Okay, it's very different from a stock. If you imagine a stock where you purchase a particular stock, let's say you're going to buy Genting at five bucks. Somebody is wanting to sell Genting at five bucks, right? And then if you're buying it and then he sells and it goes down, then you lose. Right, so 
in that sense, it's sort of zero sum if you look at the bigger picture. But when it comes to ETF, it's very different because I'm a willing buyer as well as I'm a willing seller. You're not actually uh, dealing with uh, another counterparty. I, I, you're dealing with the market maker. So when you, when, what happens when you come to the market maker is that we will hedge our position, right? So I don't really mind if you come and buy my shares and then I hedge it and the shares goes up. It's good, good for both. Right, what I earn is I earn the spread, like I said, the bid offer spread, or there's some sort of a creation or redemption arbitrage. I earn from that, right? So if the the you buy you go long this ETF, the SPY, and it goes up, all the best for everybody. So there's there's no uh, one winner and another loser in an ETF's case. Yeah. So as you have shown us that there are a, a number of ways that uh, market makers can continue to be profitable, uh, huh? Different ways for market makers to make money. So uh. Let me see the next question. Uh. Is market maker similar as operators of the stocks? <laughs> uh, this is a very uh, honest question. Thank you, Marlon, <laughs> for your, your question. But no, 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 no. We are uh, market makers are not operators of stock. Okay, first, firstly, we are regulated. As I showed you, we have uh, obligation, right? We have obligation, and we need to be registered with Bursa and things like that. So we simply providing liquid, liquid, liquidity, la, Okay, actually, liquidity provider is a better name, la, If you, if if coming from a Malaysia perspective, when there's a lot of times we think a lot about uh, operators and stuff like that. So no, yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah. So Kenneth never going stock, huh? Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot move China market. <laughs> China help you to get in and get out from ETF and also <laughs> some other structured products, la, huh, That they market make for. Okay, uh, the next question is if ETF needs market maker, but now ETF liquidity is low, is it better to use mutual fund as an alternative? Come on. Oh, I thought this uh, Kenneth is uh, better uh, in answering this. Ah, uh, okay, like uh, Kenneth. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll attempt to answer this. So, I mean, I think um. Mutual fund, first and foremost, what you want to see is the fees, right? Because if it's an actively managed mutual fund, then I think the cost sometimes can be quite high, quite prohibitive. As we said, ETF is very low, low cost sort of investment, especially if those is, is tracking an index passive, passive ETF. Those are actually very low cost. So again, the market maker is there to provide you liquidity. Uh, we don't want to talk about volume. Volume, if it's a new ETF, you might not see any volume for months on end. But as long as when you want to buy is there, uh, then 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 I don't see a problem how liquidity can be low. Yeah. Mm, okay, so it's the conclusion is uh, no liquidity issue, okay? Yep. Okay, uh, the next question is, is there any actively managed ETF? So this question is by God Lai. Uh, I think right now there's none in Malaysia so far, uh, but I think uh, globally that, that there is. And I think last year we saw that the ARC Fund by Katie Wood is one of the most famous uh, actively managed ETF. La. Yeah. But yeah. right now we don't really have it in, in the Malaysian market yet. Okay. So majority of the ETF are passively managed, but there are some uh, getting into active management style, la, huh? yeah. like a mutual fund. Okay. Uh, the next question by PY is how do you select the China ETF distributed by value partners? I don't really understand that. Exactly. Maybe I think maybe he refers to constituent stock. Is that correct? Um, I think when it comes to the constituent stocks, uh, we, we actually refer to the benchmark index, which is in our case is the Dow Jones Islamic Market China uh, 800 uh, index. Has so, it come out? Your voice is a bit softer. Huh? Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, no, is no, it louder? No. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I think when it comes to the, the, the constituent of the, the, the ETF, I think we, because it is a passively managed ETF, we usually replicate. Uh, what the Dow, what the benchmark uh, constituent like lah, uh, which is uh, in our case is the Dow Jones Islamic Market China A hundred index. Um, so yeah, I think we just follow what the 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 the, the, the index provider provide us in terms of the index composition. Mm, okay, so this is a passive fund, so they just uh, the fund managers just, just follow the index. Okay, so uh, Valerie asked the next question: Is there a best time? To buy and sell ETF units 
Like for example, before lunch time or before market close, when is market maker spread the lowest? Interesting question, huh? Hmm. Very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Valerie, for your question. But um, as a from a market maker perspective, not really. Um, as I showed earlier, we have already uh, calculated the NAV, and then we have incorporated uh, our cost inside. So most of the days, our spread will be more or less the same. So if from a spread wise, I don't think there's a perfect time to, to sort of uh, buy. But from a timing wise, I'm not too sure. Maybe maybe Kamal can answer that uh, from, from China's perspective. Is there a good time? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. Mm. Han would like to ask, like, where do we check the ETF available for trading in Busan, Malaysia? I think one that I can think of is through the Busa Marketplace website. I think uh, in there you can see all the lists of ETF available and listed in, in, in Busa Malaysia. Mm. Or on your trading platform, stock trading screen, you can Yeah, list. yeah, yeah. And that one also you can also you see. Just click to the category of ETF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Kelvin asked the next question. Is the two times leverage ETF measured for daily volatility? Is it great for buy and hold strategy? How about the expense ratio? Will it into part of the ETF gain? Mm, okay, I think I can answer this. Uh, Kelvin, yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, the ETF is based on daily returns. So when they say uh, 2x KLCI, what happens is that it, it calculates, um, let's say today KLCI goes up by 1%, your, your, technically your ETF should go up by 2%. So some people get confused because maybe if you look, uh, you buy and then you hold, then one month later you say, hey, KLC actually went up 10%. How come my ETF didn't make 20%? Because it's not, because of the daily resetting. So, so you will never have that, that what. So it's actually more of a trading tool than a buy and hold tool, uh, leverage ETFs. So then the second part of your question is how about expense ratio? Yes, for sure. Any, any, any fun or what, the expense ratio will always eat into your, your gain. So important to have an expense ratio that's very low. Mm, yeah, but generally, if you go for like, you know, a leverage ETF, right? I think the expense ratio will be slightly higher than passive ETF. Like, am I right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, because they involve, they do daily rebalancing. Balancing. So there are a lot more, a lot more costs that incur. Okay. So definitely if you go for, you know, leverage or inverse ETF, because they are leverage nature. So it is better that you do it tactically. La. I mean, do short-term trade instead of, do long term hold. Uh. If long term hold, if you go one direction, then good. Uh. If you go volatility kicks in, uh, then the compounding effect may uh, work against you. Yeah. Yeah. For more information, you can check out our leverage and inverse ETF uh, webinar. All right. So, uh, we actually in the past, we have done that before. Uh, PY would like to ask how much is the bid and offer spread uh, for ETF on the same day? Um, the Max allowable spread by Bursa is actually eight ticks. So uh, eight ticks is actually one tick is uh, uh, half cent. So actually the max spread is four, but it ranges between two to four cents. Mm, okay. Mm. So, it's between so sometimes, sometimes ETF issuers, like I just want to reiterate on that concept. We can even buy, uh, market makers, I mean, we can even buy above, uh, say, the NAV or narrow or spread. This is a lot to do with the strategy and the tactic because sometimes I can just be buying above NAV because I think that China market is going to go up, right? So yeah, it really depends. Mm, okay, I understand your point. Mm. Um, the next question is by Hua. Uh, do you think ETF will eventually replace Unitrust? Uh? Um, I don't think so. I think there's always a room for both to actually coexist. Um, of course, I mean, uh, from time to time, they might, uh, we might see some cannibalization, uh, but, I, uh, but I do believe that the, 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 the share of pie is getting larger and larger. So that's definitely a room for both to, to coexist in the market. Mm, yeah. The next question is, there are always bid and ask, uh, how about the spread of bid and ask? What are the criteria so that the market maker provide a narrow spread? Mm, as mentioned, more market makers, you get a narrower spread. 
because uh, different cost structure, it becomes more competitive, becomes more efficient. Uh, so brand new ETFs, usually you have a slightly wider spread. And yeah, I think that, that determines the number of market makers. Mm. So I think a larger AUM ETF will attract more market makers. Huh? Yeah. So yeah. will get involvement of more market makers, so the spread will be more competitive. Okay. Marcus Mock would like to ask, what is the selection criteria and frequency when an established ETF add or delete the underlying stocks? Um, all right. So I think for a passively managed ETF, uh, it all depends on how the benchmark, uh, the underlying benchmark is being, um, I mean, I mean uh, is, 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 is being done. Lah. So I think for our Dow Jones Islamic Market China 800 uh, index, I think the, the, the rebalancing is done uh, every quarter. Uh, so in terms of frequency, the the the, the rebalancing for the ETF will also be done uh, four times a year, lah. Mm, okay, yeah. thank you, thank you, Kamal. Are there any penalty if the fund deviate too much from the index or fail to track the index? Ah? what motivate market maker to track index closely as ETF can have their own settlement price? Um. Okay. It in where, Okay, I think there's two parts to this question. Whether it the, the fund deviate too much from, say, the benchmark. That one, I think, is a come out to answer. But for the part where what motivates market maker to track index closely, it's because of, like what we mentioned, the, um, the creation or redemption arbitrage. Whenever the price uh, is, is above the NAV, right, or above the index in this case, the market makers has a lot of uh, intention or incentive to sell, right? Because we want to make this, so as more and more market makers sell, this, this, this arbitrage open, opportunity uh, dissipates. So it sort of disappears over time because of uh, selling pressure and, and uh, buying pressure of the, uh, the ETF baskets. So, so market maker always would uh, take on all this opportunity. This, this is what makes money for us. So yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's crucial. Mm. So we'll come out, take the first question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think when it comes to the penalty, um, uh, I, I mean, that's, I mean, there's no really a penalty for it, but it will actually uh, reflect it in the tracking error of the ETF. Lah. So we might get punished by, by, by investors then I mean, questioning why the tracking error suddenly shot up to probably uh, three, I mean, I mean, four or five percent instead of now it's about 0 0.8 percent. So I think when it comes to the division, the, the tracking error will be the, the, I mean, the where you actually look at. Uh, to, to, to know whether or not the fund actually deviate from the benchmark. Mm. Okay. The the next question is by Tony. Uh, uh I, I I try to under I try to read the question to you. Uh, uh if underlying chain structure will ETF follow? Are they referring to, uh, is he referring to the changes in the underlying bench? I mean, I mean, okay, let's say, uh, like I said, if let's say it's uh, like a rebalancing of the underlying benchmarks, uh, then definitely our ETF will have to follow the, 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 the rebalancing as well. Lah. So let's say uh, the, the, the uh, benchmark actually removed 10 stocks and, and added a, 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 another 10 stocks, then we actually have to follow suit by removing the, the, the 10 stocks uh, and, then by, and then putting in the new 10 stocks. Lah. Mm. Okay, so thank you so much, Kamal. I think that will uh, that will conclude our Q and A session. Yeah? so uh, you know, looks like uh, the time is running out for this uh, segment. And thank you so much for all your questions. I think uh, uh, we are we have uh, answered a lot of questions uh, easily. I think easily uh, thirty questions. Okay, so for, for this Q and A session, so thank you so much to both our speakers, Kenneth and uh, Kamal. So it's only on the rare occasion that we can get you know fund managers and also uh, market makers to join in this segment to discuss about ETF, the strategy, and also the uh, market making and liquidity. All right. So hope that you all learn a lot from this uh, segment. So uh, last but not least, allow me to briefly share my screen uh, to tell you more about uh, uh, Bursa Academy. So Bursa Academy is a comprehensive one-stop e-learning platform that aims to provide investors with a continuous and holistic learning journey. 
So it's simplified, user-friendly, accessible anywhere at, at any time at your own pace. So if you want to learn more about Bursa Academy, you can head over to www.bursaacademy.bursamarketplace.com. So essentially, it is a one-stop e-learning platform that provides you with a lot of investing resources such as articles, uh, quizzes, you know, courseworks, you know, videos, and also webinar recordings you can find at Bursa Academy. All right. So uh, due to time constraint, we can only uh, give you so much in terms of, uh, you know, in this segment. So if you want to know more about uh, knowledge in other products, okay, like structural warrants, you know, on, like leverage and inverse ETF or trading strategies, market information, you can always head over to www.bursamacademy.bursamarketplace.com to learn more about uh, investing. All right. So, uh, Yes, my last slide is with that. Thank you so much to both our speakers, Kamal Mustaza and Kenneth Teo, who, who, uh, who is a Senior Vice President of uh, Equity Derivatives under the Nanga Investment Bank to join us in this, uh, uh, in this webinar. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, email them to ask more about that. All right, so with that, thank you everybody for tuning in until the end of this session. So you, see you all in our next Bursa webinar. So bye everybody. Have a thank great you. Evening. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye, Kamal. Bye, Kenneth. Hope Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Shane. Kamal. Bye, Kenneth. Bye. Okay, bye.